Okay, today's class was intended to be, um, I mentioned to Wendy that I would make the class um, about the concept of divine providence, Hashkocha uh, Pratis. I assume the sound is okay, right? Yeah. Okay, that it will be about Hashkoch Pratis, individual divine providence. But uh, just looking back in the archives, I see that there was a class on that uh, not so long ago. And uh, so I'm going to do something else tonight um, instead. Uh, you can catch that class up there in the, in the archives. Uh, just go to Kabbalah Decoded, www.kabbalahdecoded.com. And go to the videos link, the videos uh, tab, and then um, unfortunately you'll have to put your um, your name and so on and so forth in the uh, tab so that it can open up for you. The I mean in the uh, in the question box there it has a place for your name. Just click on it, submit, and uh, submit a form, and then a Dropbox link will open up and look over there for uh, the video called the Divine Providence. You'll find it there. Okay. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to do an interesting um, teaching of the Arizal, uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, who talks about the discussion that went on, uh, that goes on in this week's uh, section, this week's Torah reading, the discussion that goes on between Jacob, Yaakov, and Paroi, Pharaoh, between Jacob and Pharaoh. Um, Joseph, as, you know, as we know, was the viceroy in Egypt, uh, the second in charge. He was appointed as such by Pharaoh, and eventually uh, Jacob and his uh, and Joseph's brothers all come down to Egypt, and then um, Joseph brings his father Yaakov, Jacob, in to meet uh, Pharaoh, and the exchange is an interesting one. Pharaoh says uh, to Jacob, he asks him, how old are you? And uh, Jacob says, at the time he was 130 years old. But he says, that he makes a strange statement. He says, uh, 130 years old I am, but my days have been evil and few evil and few, ma'at veroim, or few and evil, rather. Now, what did Jacob mean by this? He wasn't just uh, sort of making a statement. Um, what was his mindset? One would think that the patriarch, the third of the patriarchs, uh, Jacob is the third patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Aram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, the third patriarch, who is called the Bechir Sheba Avois, the, uh, the most, most cherished by God of the patriarchs, that he would have a little bit more of a positive attitude towards things. What does he mean? Uh, yeah, I basically had a lousy life up until now. <laughs> what on earth did he mean? So, um, one of the uh, one of the explanations is as follows: interesting explanation that says like this. Pharaoh knew either subconsciously or uh, or consciously. Don't forget, he had the chartumim. Chartumim were like wizards and sorcerers and things like that. They knew a lot of stuff, and they could do a lot of things, as we know later on from the plagues and so on. They were able to uh, discern. Uh, certain aspects of wisdom, um, wisdom that was that came from so impure sources, but nevertheless they were able to uh, discern and understand a lot of things and manipulate uh, the forces of nature uh, to some extent. So they were able to find out, to know, to understand that um, The prophecy that was given to Abraham that his children would go into exile for 400 years. Now, the 400 years uh, doesn't begin from the time that the that uh, not even from, not from the time that um, 
Jacob, Yaakov, and his sons went down to Egypt. But the Egyptian exile actually began before that. It began even in the time, even before Joseph was brought down. It began really in the time of, possibly in the time of Abraham, or in the time of Isaac. But in any event, the, uh, the exile had already sort of started. But Pharaoh was very, um, he was very crafty, let's put it that way, wily. And he knew about this prophecy, apparently, uh, that they would serve, they would be subservient, that the Jewish people would be subservient to the Egyptians and be their slaves for 400 years. From the time that Jacob goes down to Egypt until they come out, he's only 210. So the uh, rest of the 400 begins from before that, from the time of Abraham, really. In any event, Pharaoh knew that they were going to be there for a very long period of time. So he says to Jacob, uh, to Yaakov, uh, how old are you? His intention, according to this explanation, was that Jacob would answer, I'm, uh, I'm whatever his age was, 130 years old. Thank you. And, uh, you know, basically I had a wonderful life and so on and so forth. Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's hidden intention was that that's what Jacob would say. He was used to this kind of way of talking from Joseph. Because Yosef, Joseph, when he spoke, he always spoke in positive terminology. He always used positive words. Which he was taught, in fact, by his father. His father, Jacob. When Jacob went in to get the blessings from Isaac instead of Esau, instead of Esau, when he went into Yitzchak, so... Isaac could sense that, although he was blind, he couldn't see, he could sense that something was different, Rashi points out, because he used the language that Esau, Esau, wasn't used to using. Esau was a rough character, and he spoke in very rough ways, even to his father, even though he respected his father tremendously, and he honored his father, which is his redeeming feature, in fact. But uh, he would say things like, okay, dad, it's time to get up. Or uh, dad, um, you know, he, he, he would be like very, um, whereas Jacob spoke to his father as my father, not just dad or uh, pops, you know. <laughs> he spoke to him in a much more, um, in, a, in a reverential way, which is the proper way. So Joseph had learned this from, uh, from his father, how to speak properly. And in fact, um, Pharaoh had gotten used to that way of speaking. So he thought that when Joseph's father comes down, for sure he's going to speak in, a, um, in the same way as Joseph, as his son. So why was it that, uh, that, that Jacob spoke like this? I have 130 terrible years. He did have a tough life, it's true, he had a tough life. But why was he so adamant to, uh, to express it that way? So again, the answer is, he was adamant to express, express it that way because Pharaoh knew that there would be slaves for a very long time, 210 years from the time that Jacob came down. And uh, it actually started before that, it was 400 years altogether. So what he wanted to do, consciously or unconsciously, was exclude all of Jacob's 130 years from the amount of time that the uh, Israelites would be in servitude to, to him. In other words, that 130 years wouldn't count. They would still have to make up that 130 years because if Jacob would have said, he wouldn't have said, if Jacob wouldn't have said, my life until now was terrible, he would have implied at least that his life was good and possibly he would have said, if he would have said, my life was wonderful up until now, I have wonderful children and so on and so forth, then that 130 years that he already lived that was part of the 400 years would not have been counted as part of the 400 years. Okay? Understood? That's the first explanation. Now there is a second explanation, a much deeper explanation. 
the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Aram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, were in fact reincarnations of aspects of Adam. Adam. Adam Arisho and Adam, who um, sinned with the uh, fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We've spoken about that uh, a couple of times already, what that means. In any event, um, after he had sinned, so he separated from his wife. How long did he separate from his wife for? Does anyone know? So he separated from his wife for 130 years. He separated from his wife for 130 years. Now, during the time that he was separated from his wife, uh, which is not the ideal situation at all, um, the uh, yeah, in 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 the Torah, celibacy is not a virtue. Celibacy is a, is is in a sense a vice. <laughs> it's not a good thing, negative thing. Um, the Torah says it's not good for man to be alone it needs to be a partnership it's only through the partnership of husband and wife that one can come to wholeness it's only through that partnership and that's the way it is with what's called the Yichud of the Svirot, or the Yichud of the Partsufim. The Svirot are arranged in the world of Tikkun, in the world of rectification. The Svirot are arranged in clusters. Um, and they're called by various names, for example, Abba and Ima, which literally translated means father and mother. But Abba and Ima are so-called, um, they, 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 this terminology is used to give us an understanding of what their function is. Just like a mother and father produce offspring and care for them, so to Abba and Ima, i.e. Chochma and Bina, uh, produce offspring and take care of them, the other Svirot. But Chochmah and Bina, as in individual spherot, do not unite. They do not become partners. Only as parts of him, in other words, as built up spherot, with each of them having their full, their full complement of spherot within them. So, in other words, Chochmah would be Kesa Shabbat Chochmah, Chochmah Shabbat Chochmah, Bina Shabbat Chochmah, and so on and so forth. It has all of the entire array of Svirot within it, and then it is called Abba. Then it can come into a relationship. That's called a Paratsuf, it can come into a relationship. Similarly with Ima, Bina, is only called Ima when it is fully expressed in terms of its faculties. And it's only fully expressed when it's ready to um, couple with, unite with, the other Svira, when Bina is ready to unite with Chochmah or Abba Ve'ima, and that's called the Yichud of the Svirot, the unification of the Svirot. Similarly, Zer Anpin and Malchut, Zer Anpin is the sixth Svirot from Chesed through Yesod, Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Netzachot, Yesod, joins together with Malchut in a different kind of Yichud. That's called Yichud Tata'a. Yichud law is Abba Ve'ima, Yichud Atata, the lower Yichud, the lower unification, is Zer Anpin and Malchut. The high unification is Chochma and Bino, or rather Abba and Ima, as parts of him. So, <clears throat> now, when, when Adam was separated from his uh, separated from Eve, when he separated himself from Eve, he was not performing this concept of unification of Yichud, which is the opposite of the intention. 
The intention is pru uruvu umilu asaretz v'kipshua. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Subdue it, not in the sense of it has to be subdued, but bring it into the right path. Bring the world into the right path. We keep sure conquer it in the sense, in a positive sense, not conquer it, rule over it harshly, but conquer it essentially with love, but conquer it in a, in a way that it becomes subservient to God that it also, that everything in the world starts to serve God, which was what Adam was really put in the Garden of Eden for. And initially he started doing that. When he was created, all of the other creatures, he was created last in creation, all the other creatures came and they bowed down to Adam and said, they thought that he was God. He was, uh, they thought he was God. And he said, no, let us all together prostrate ourselves before the Holy One, let us be before, before God. So the fact that he separated after the sin, he felt that he had to separate from his wife, um, is, was the wrong thing to do. Now, one of the reasons that explaining Kabbalah, actually one of the Kabbalists uh, explains that the reason that Adam separated from, uh, from his wife was because after the sin, he gave birth to Cain. Cain, Cain and Abel, you've all heard of them, heard of them but Cain says this um, um, commentary on the Zohar, Cain was a primate. He didn't have a human form. He looked like an ape. Why? Because this was right after the sin. That affected him to the extent that he didn't, he was born as a primate, so the uh, conclusion of that explanation really is that where do the primates come from? It's not that man descends from the primates, as uh, Darwin would have it. It's the other way around. The primates descend from man, from uh, from Cain, from Cain. Uh, if anyone wants to look this up, this is from the commentary called Ziv HaZohar. Interesting idea. In any event, um, uh, let's continue. So. Adam was separated from his wife, Chava, for uh, 130 years. And during that time of separation, um, many things that should have been done were not done. Many um, unifications that could have been made were not made. And therefore, there had to be a rectification. That rectification was performed by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Aram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Abraham rectified the nefesh of Adam. As we know, the soul has five levels, the five levels of the soul, five levels of consciousness, if you want to put it that way. These five levels of consciousness are called nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yechida. Nefesh is the lowest uh, aspect, that's the life of the body. Ruach is the energy of the emotions. Neshama is the energy of intellect, and Chaya and Yechida are transcendental powers of the soul, the will of the soul, Chaya, and Yechida, the delight of the soul in its unification with God. The top two levels don't need rectification, only the bottom three, Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, require rectification. But the others do not require rectification. The other two higher levels do not require rectification. So, or at least we're talking about Adam now. He's the low, three lower levels require rectification. Abraham, the first of the patriarchs, rectified the level of nefesh. Yitzchak, Isaac, rectified the level of ruach. And Yaakov, Jacob, rectified the level of neshama, soul. Um, the, the, the third level. Now there's various um, uh, explanations, further explanations uh, of exactly how this took place and how you see it. But one of the verses uh, with Abraham, with Abraham is, uh, it says like this, Ve'et ha-nefesh asher asu b'charan. 
the nefesh that they made in Haran. They went to when Abraham and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, rectified the level of nefesh in Haran. They made the nefesh, in other words, they rectified it. Asher Asu, they completed it. They completed what Adam had not completed. Similarly, with, uh, um, uh, with Yitzhak, with Isaac, so he rectified the level of Ruach, and there is also a verse which is associated with, uh, with Isaac, with Yitzhak, which shows that he, um, uh, which shows that he, that he rectified the level of Ruach. I forget what the verse is now. And similarly with, uh, with Jacob, there is, a, there is also a verse which, uh, which indicates this. Now, Why then is Jacob telling Pharaoh, Yaakov telling Paroi, that the 130 years, the first 130 years of his life are bad, they're terrible, they were terrible, ma'at ve'roim heim, they're few and very ter terrible years, because this was the time that he was, up until this time he had been rectifying the neshama, the level of soul, called neshama of Adam. The 130 years uh, of his life was a rectification. Only then, when he came down to Egypt, did he then live, or rather to Goshen, which was part of Egypt, but on the, uh, technically it was separated, uh, it wasn't actually in Egypt itself, it was a province, uh, called Goshen. So only there did he live a good life. Over there it says, Vayechi Yaakov. Only now is it Jacob's turn to live. Up until that time, he'd, he'd lived the life of Adam, and that's what he was doing the entire time with the sheep and the flocks and so on and so forth, with Lavan. And all of what he was doing was rectification of the soul of, of, of the neshama of Adam, of Adam. But then from that on, the 17 years that he lived together with his sons and with Joseph in Goshen, those 17 years were the good years of his life. The numerical value of the word tov, tov is 17. Numerical values in Hebrew, uh, each word has a numerical value, each letter has a numerical value. Add up the values of the various letters of the word that spell a word, and that can sometimes reveal to you certain um, ideas. So the 17 years that he spent in Goshen were the 17 best years of his life. Why? Because he had now rectified the neshama of Adam. And therefore, he could now live his own life. And that's why it says now, Vayechi Yaakov. Now Yaakov lived. In Eretz Mitzrayim, when he was in Egypt, in Goshen technically, but nevertheless called Egypt, that's when it's Vayechi, that's when he lived. His own life. So, we too um, may find that certain things in our lives are inexplicably unpleasant. Now, that could just be an attitude that they're unpleasant. It could be that they're actually a lot less unpleasant than uh, one thinks they are. But because we have all these kinds of my life should be more pleasant, I should be living like a, uh, you know, living the life of Riley, so to speak. Um, or, uh, you know, I should be having an, a much easier life or a better. So that, that could also be one of the reasons why we think our lives are terrible. But it can happen that people have very tough times during their life. That tough, tough time during a person's life may well be, it may well be, as a result of the concept of Gilgal, of the reincarnation of previous situations where we have to um, rectify things that were done previously. There's a famous story which is told um, 
about the successor to the Baal Shem Tov, the Magid Mizrich. Um, the Magid Mizrich um, was very far seeing, which doesn't mean he only had good eyesight, but he could see things very, very far away. Um, in fact, this, before I tell you that story, there's another amusing little story where someone uh, was robbed. His house was robbed. And uh, one, of, one of the Hasidim, one of the followers, one of the disciples of the Magid Mizrich, his house was robbed. So he went to his Rebbe and said, uh, you know, he just uh, he told him, my house was robbed. So the Magid said, uh, excuse me a minute. He went out of the room for, uh, for a few minutes. And then he came back and he said, uh, go to such and such a place and you'll find all your possessions there. And he went and he found the possessions and, uh, <laughs> and he took them away from the thief and uh, gave the thief a little bit of a hard time, as you can understand. In any event, uh, the thief then went to the Magid and said to him, Rabbi, you know, you're a very holy man. Like, what, you know, why do you spend your time looking at thieves? <laughs> what, I, what I'm doing. So the Magid said, well, I, I was in the bathroom at the time. I went to the bathroom. That's when I was looking at that. <laughs> That's when I saw you, um, that you were the robber. <laughs> in any event. Um, uh, so Kimberly asked, yes, yeah, so would the exile be for the purpose of rectification? Yes, it was. Uh, is it possible for a person living today, could they rectify a person in the past? Yes. We can rectify ours, we can rectify someone else's. So this is what I want to tell you, the, uh, the story of the Magid, which is a rectification of a certain sort. Now, this, the, that was just an introductory story. This is the real story that I wanted to tell you. So this person came to the Magid Mitzvah and he said he doesn't understand this whole concept of Gilgal. Uh, it was the week of the parasha, which is called um, uh, Mishpatim. Mishpatim, the word Mishpatim means judgments, like legal judgments. But the Zohar, in commenting, uh, commenting on, the, on, the, uh, on this, this reading, which begins with the word um, Shoftim, uh, Mishpatim rather, which begins with the word Mishpatim, judgments. So the Zohar said, this is the secret of incarnations. Of various incarnations. So this person came to the Magid Mizrich, the successor to the Baal Shem Tov, and yeah, he, he said he, he doesn't understand the Zohar. Know, what does the Zohar mean? So the Magid said to him, let me explain to you. If I, ex if I give you an explanation, the classical explanations, it's not going to help you understand anything. Go to such and such a spot, uh, there's a there's a uh, road that goes through a forest, or not not really a forest, but a wooded area. There's a road that goes through a wooded area. Now, if you go near that wooded area, if you go there's a there's a hill behind that wooded area from which you can see the road, and just sit there, go over there, and watch, and come back and tell me what happens. So that's what he did. The next day, he went to this place, and uh, you know, he took with him his uh, whatever, a bottle of water and some food, whatever, and he sat there and he watched. One of the things that he saw was uh, very uh, interesting. It was a warm summer's day, just like in Chicago, right? <laughs> so um, it was a nice warm summer's day. So he was watching. And he saw a man um, coming to um, to the road, and just on the side of the road, there was a nice sort of shady spot, and a good place to sit down and take a rest. So he saw a fellow come, and he sat down to take a rest, and because it was a nice, uh, very warm day. So I actually lay down for a little bit, and he, you know, I took off his, uh, took off his hat or whatever, and he, uh, he lay down on the grass for a, for a, for a few minutes, and then he uh, got up and left. 
Shortly after that, another man came, and he also saw this like nice, uh, shady, grassy spot. And he also sat down. And when he sat down, he saw that um, right next to him, there was a, a wallet. He opens the wallet. Or in those days, there wasn't a wallet. We call the money pouch. He opens the money pouch. He doesn't see any signs of identification on it, who it belongs to, whatever. But it has a lot of money in it. So he puts the money in his pocket, and he's very happy uh, because he was a poor person. And uh, off he goes. Then a third person comes, and he also sits down in that grassy spot. And just as he's getting up and he's uh, putting his jacket back on, the first guy comes back, and he says to the, sec to the third guy, meanwhile, the second guy is gone. He was going the other direction. He says to the third guy, where's my wallet? I left it here. I dropped my wallet over here, my money bag by the tree. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, yes, you do. It was right over there, just exactly where you were sitting. And no one else came by in the meanwhile, so you, have, you must have seen it. Look around, it's not there. So he says, you have it and you're lying. Anyway, a fight sort of ensued, an argument ensued, and eventually the uh, angry uh, guy who lost his wallet slapped the other fellow over the face and uh, pummeled him a couple times, and uh, that was the end of the story, and he left in a half. Nothing more uh, happened um, that day uh, of interest. So the fellow went back, the student of the Magid of Mizrich, went back to the Magid, and he told him what had happened. So the Magid said, that's the sword of Gilgulim. This is the secret of Gilgulim. Let me tell you what happened. The first guy that came over there was a businessman in a previous life. And uh, he had a dispute with another businessman who was the second guy. So they went to a rabbi for, um, uh, to, to resolve the dispute between them, because that's what you do. You go to a rabbi who understands Jewish law, and he'll resolve the dispute. But the rabbi was in a hurry, and he didn't think it through properly, and he didn't look up the sources, so he ruled incorrectly. And he ruled that the second guy owed money to the first. But because he ruled incorrectly, that money had to be given back in a subsequent life. And that's what you saw. When he left, when he dropped his wallet, when he dropped his money bag by the tree in this little grassy spot, and the second fellow picked it up, that was the money that was owed to him. Now, what about the third person? The third person was the rabbi who gave the wrong ruling. <laughs> so he got a slap in the face for, uh, for his, uh, for his uh, lack of, um, um, for his haste in, in, in producing a ruling. which should never be done in haste, it should be done thoughtfully and carefully. Anyway, so that is said, so that's at the Magid is the explanation of Gilgul. Things happen in your life which you have no idea why they happen, but they happen for a reason perhaps in some cases to correct a previous um, event that might not have been the way it should have been. So there you go. So that is what um, Jacob was doing. He was rectifying what Adam had done wrong. And that's why it says, Shufre de Yaakov, Ka'en Shufre de Adam Arishon, the beauty of Yaakov, of Jacob, was like the beauty of Adam, of Adam. Which doesn't mean that they were both uh, physically, uh, you know, Brad Pitt or whatever. No, that doesn't, uh, that's not what they uh, were. Brad Pitt is it's a movie star, right? Handsome, supposedly. Uh, whatever, anyway, let's not go there. But they, they, what it means is Shufre, the beauty of Yaakov. In other words, the, 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 uh, the completeness of his soul, the shining out of his soul, that's the beauty of a person. The shine that a person has, the glow that a person has, is the person's beauty. And his beauty was like that of the glow, of, his glow was like the glow of Adam before the sin, because he rectified it. 
Okay, let me just take some questions here. Um, um, is it possible for a person living today, could they rectify a person in the past? Yes. Uh, can a parent rectify their child's past if this is their desire? Um, it is always preferable for the person himself to rectify himself. It's possible for a parent to rectify a child, it's possible, if the child, um, it's possible, but it doesn't usually work like that. It's usually the child that will rectify the parents, don't you know? <laughs> Your children always try to correct you, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, people always why bad things happen. Why don't we ask when good things happen and just appreciate them? Absolutely correct. Absolutely. That is the right attitude to have. Why don't we ask why, when good things happen or why good things happen and um, and learn to appreciate them? That's that's what we have to do, yes. But when bad things do happen, we could always say, you know, gam zula toiva, this too is for the good, although we might not understand what it is, we might not understand what the purpose is, and it might be at the time unpleasant, but nevertheless, uh, it may nevertheless be for the good. Pain is a good teacher. Yes, it is, uh, says Terry. That is absolutely true, although we don't ask for it. We ask not to be in pain. We ask not to be in... Um, good and bad is not... Uh, uh, is, is, uh, it, it, it can be, to a certain extent, only a value judgment, but certain things can be painful. Uh, you know, a person can, God forbid, uh, lose a limb or something or get hurt in an accident. And that is, it's painful. There may actually be pain involved, yes. But uh, there's a lot of perception involved with pain, you're right. And that perception may be an incorrect or exaggerated perception. We may regard uh, a, a negative event, an adverse event, as catastrophic where it's only just mildly uncomfortable <laughs> or inconvenient. Um, is it possible to know when one has come to a completion of rectification and then enter a type of rest? It is possible, yes. Uh, however, Jacob tried that and found that... Um, it wasn't ideal. I had a friend uh, who since passed away, unfortunately. He was uh, quite a bit older than me, but um, he, um, this was in Israel, and he lived in a place called, the neighborhood was called Harnoff, where I also lived there. And um, he lived right at the end of the neighborhood, and the end of the neighborhood on the far, if you looked out over the valley, over to the next hill, you could see on a clear day, you could see a famous cemetery over there, which is called Harman Khot. It was far away. It was like um, Harman Khot was several miles away. But you could see it on a clear day. Harman Khot means the, uh, mountain of the, the, the mountain of rest, of resting place. So this particular fellow was a person who drove himself very hard. Um, he would get up very, very early in the morning. Yeah, Goshen is still there, yeah. He would get up very early in the morning and he would work very hard all day. And when I say work hard, I don't mean, you know, like physical labor, but he would work on himself. He would study, he would study with other people, he would work on himself, he would pray it for long, uh, long periods of time. It's a person that really worked on himself. And he always said, when people asked him why he works himself so hard, he would always say, take them over to the window where you could see the Haram uh, Nukhot from, where you could see the uh, cemetery on the, on the mountain in the distance. He would say, after 120 years, I'll have plenty of time to rest. So yes, it's possible that a person can come to rest now, but it's, possible, it's probably unlikely. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Doesn't mean to say that uh, you know one shouldn't uh, have moments or periods of one's life which are more restful than another than others. Could be that some people do have that, but to sort of go into early retirement from uh, from what we call Abu Dhabi Shem, serving God, serving the Almighty, to go into a rest period is not 
that's usually not rest. It's usually just laziness. Usually, uh, I'm not talking about you necessarily. I'm just talking about in general. Okay. Uh, how was it that the wizards were able to discern things and manipulate forces of nature? Did they have a price to pay for that use as well? Uh, to a certain extent, they did have a price to pay in the sense that they often did not see clearly. And because they didn't see clearly, they made predictions that were incorrect and um, suffered the consequences of that sometimes. But there are powers called the powers of impurity or the powers of unholiness that um, some use. And unfortunately, uh, eventually it comes back to bite them. Yes, eventually. Uh, so it's rest like a pause. Yes, that's correct. Um, we're in the middle of running and returning. Exactly. Yep. 